favorite parts about doing this whole like, 12 cities in 12 months experience is that people give us these ideas about different things we should do as we're in these different places. Like the other day, somebody suggested on our Instagram account that we check out hiking around Point Loma. We did some research, we learned a little bit more. This seems pretty intriguing, so we're gonna go check it out. We're Chris and Melissa. Back in 2020, we left our empty nest to travel and rediscover ourselves by taking on new challenges and following our curiosity. Today, we're off to see where European explorers first came ashore in California. It's about a 38 minute drive to Point Loma from our nomadic home in the North Park neighborhood of San Diego. I don't think we'd be going to Point Loma if it weren't for the slow travel trend that we've kind of stumbled into. I'm so glad we have because we get to experience and see so much of an area by living in it for a month. We also get to go beyond the typical tourist destinations. National Monument. And what are we looking forward to see at Cabrillo National Monument? Well, there's a couple things. Uh, one is whales. Gray whales are migrating south from the Arctic down to like the Baja area where they're going to do their mating and have some uh, summer fun. And then the tide pools, right? Yes, the tide pools. This is the perfect time of year both for whale watching and for checking out the tide pools because the tide is low during the day while the park is open for a few hours at least. So we're getting out there first thing in the morning. Uh, low tide was at 8.30, so we should be good to go. It is 9.01. What's the tide pool? We looked it up before heading out. It's a depression in the rocks formed over millions of years. As the tide rises and lowers, it leaves pools of water in the rocks and traps the sea creatures until the tide rises again. I'm rather excited about the idea of being able to see octopus. I read that sometimes there are octopus in the tide pool, so I'm hoping. That'd be cool to see a little tiny octopus just sitting there and doing this thing. Really busy because he's got all those arms and legs, what are they called? <laughs> Spot the nature experts. Yeah, we're out of our element. Awesome, we paid 80 bucks for this, so we should be able to get in free and not pay the, what, what was it, $35? 35, 35 for annual. I think it, it's $20 if you're just coming for the day. The park opens at 9, low tide was at 8.30. They say the best time for viewing the tide pools is two hours before and after low tide. So we're going down to the tide pools first. It is a Sunday after Christmas. We just pulled into the tide pool parking lot. It is, what time is it, 9 something? Oh, actually, here, let me look at my watch. Uh, it is 9.11 a.m. and the parking lot is pretty sparse. So we are looking forward to having the place kind of to ourselves. excited about the idea of seeing octopus and like some interesting things. I'm also a little freaked out like about seeing creepy crawly things. Yeah, Melissa does not like creepy crawly things. Like if a spider shows up at her house, she freaks out. I have a feeling this could be a little, this could be weird. Yeah, I'm building my relationship with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Honey, let me introduce you to some crustaceans. Come on. <laughs> It does not look like it's low tide. It's a short walk and scramble down to the tide pools. Although we arrived a little after low tide, today's low tide wasn't very low, so we missed the opportunity to view the creatures. It was still a cool sight to see. It's surprisingly firm. I think we missed the tide pools, but it's still pretty amazing to see all the craziness of aquatic ocean life. Yeah, it means stuff on the beach. Yeah. 
You okay? Yeah. You have to do a little bit of climbing. Not much, just a little. If the conditions were awesome and it was low, low tide, I think we'd see a lot of those depressions and there'd be a little animal life in there. That's what I think. You're probably right. Sometimes I am right. You're often right. Or no, I'm often right. You're seldom wrong. I'm seldom wrong. <laughs> Never does that. What's going on? I was waiting for you. You weren't just sitting there chilling, enjoying the views? I was doing that while I was waiting for you. Let's say you came here without me, and so you weren't waiting for me. Would you have done this? With a notebook and pen in hand, maybe. So you wouldn't have done it just to enjoy and take it all in? I could like take it all in standing up and walking. <laughs> Weirdo. We hiked the coastal trail right next to the tide pool area before driving up to the other Cabrillo National Monument sites. is about a mile of gorgeous rugged terrain and more than worth taking the time to do. What are those things over there? Those things? Yeah, those things. They look weird. They're agave plants. We learned about them at the San Diego Botanic Garden. Up at the Cabrillo National Monument Visitor Center, you can learn all about Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. Until today, I had never even heard of him. It's part of the Age of Exploration exhibit. The exhibit covers details about the arrival of Cabrillo's flotilla in San Diego Bay on September 28, 1542. It was the first time a European expedition set foot on the west coast of what would later become the United States. It was interesting learning about how early explorers navigated the oceans. The old Point Loma Lighthouse is a short walk from the visitor center. Point Loma was the first lighthouse in San Diego. When it was put into service in 1855, it was the highest in the United States. Its elevation proved problematic. Fog and low clouds obscured its light. So in 1891, a lighthouse was built at a lower elevation. The lighthouse quarters looked mighty nice, but we learned that the isolation of living here caused a lot of turnover among keepers and assistants. We tried whale watching, but we were short on binoculars and patience. On to more history and hiking. Behind this door is a five foot diameter searchlight that was used during World Wars One and Two. So if they saw a sneaky looking boat coming in the harbor, they would open these doors and wheel out the searchlight and then boom, right on the boat and basically scare them out of the bay. Uh, okay, maybe they wouldn't scare them out of the bay, but then the light would point at them and then <laughs> they could shoot rockets at them, I'm guessing, right? Well, what it said on the sign was that they used the searchlight to track the boat. Yeah, track it so they could send rockets at it. Okay, rocket man. Okay. <laughs> Check out this piece of real estate in San Diego. It was a bunker used during World War II. Every single night, soldiers would stay in here. They would have to start up a generator, which would usually start on fire. They would have to put out the fire, and then they would get to eat and do what soldiers did at the time. The generator was what powered that big, huge searchlight up the way. It's pretty cool. The Bayside Trail was a little over a mile downhill. Straight across from us is Ballast Point, which is where a Cabrillo ship is said to have landed. Way back in the 1500s. Yeah, 1542. 
I think. Let me check. Oh, yes, 1542. Ding, ding, ding. Pretty good chance that none of those buildings were there. I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking they weren't there. So it was basically, it just looked like this. Just that. A lot has changed. <laughs> okay, we gotta head back up. Let's go. Isn't that an amazing view? If you want to see more hikes with great views, check out this Vancouver Island hike we did. Yeah, and then we climbed a mountain, the Chief, in Canada. Great views there. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs>